I want to welcome you again to our Bible study. We are examining the gospel according to Luke in the New Testament, and today our study has to do with chapter 6 of that great book. We will be looking at some of the Sabbath healings of Jesus on his choosing his apostles and on the early outdoor preaching that he did. So let's turn immediately to chapter 6 of the book of Luke. The first two verses say, It happened on the second Sabbath after the first, that he went through the grain fields, and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? What the disciples were doing on this day, this Sabbath day, was permissible. But to the Jews, it was not permissible on the Sabbath day. In Pharisaic tradition, plucking and rubbing grain to eat was considered both harvesting and preparing a meal. Thus, it was laboring or working on the Sabbath day. Now, the scripture did not so specify that application of the law. It was their tradition. Jesus would have much to say about their attitudes toward tradition, attitudes that bound traditions as if they were the commandments of God. You might want to read in Matthew chapter 15 specifically how Jesus thought of that. He said, Why do you transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? Verse 3. He said, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Verse 6. And in verse 9 he says, in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Jewish rabbis later identified 39 traditions that the Pharisees had had in New Testament times. These traditions regarded forbidden activities in their minds on the Sabbath. These traditions, these 39 identified traditions, are found in the Mishnah writings of Jewish rabbis. You will find there that 11 of these traditions had to do with preparing food, including farming the grain. Thirteen of them had to do with making clothing, including dealing with sheep and wool. Seven of them had to do with animals, including preparing meat from the animals. Two of them had to do with writing, If you wrote more than two letters, you were working. Five of them had to do with building, construction work, and one had to do with traveling and transporting property. So you can see how defined the Jews were in specifying applications of the law that God had not specified in the Pentateuch. The Sabbath law was important to the Jews, and we want to be sure we understand that the Sabbath law was important to Jesus as well. It was a covenant sign The Law of Moses had two special signs of covenant relationship with God. It had a personal sign first, and that was circumcision. 
the personal sign that a man was an Israelite was that he was circumcised. And that goes all the way back to Abraham, recorded in Genesis chapter 17. The other special sign of covenant relationship to God was the Sabbath. It was the collective national sign that God favored Israel, that he was their God, and they were his people. So they had a personal sign, circumcision, and then a collective national sign that God was their God. When the nations around about looked at Israel from the outside, they saw on the Sabbath day a nation of people at rest. Because this was a sign to Israel, it was not required of all other nations. So, while Jesus did not keep all the Pharisaic traditions, he very carefully observed what the law itself said because it was such an important part of God's covenant with Israel. Of course, under the gospel, the Sabbath days were removed from obligation spiritually. And you can read about that in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. Now some of the Pharisees said to them, and I'm back reading verse 2, beginning in Luke 6, said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? But Jesus answering them said, Have you not even read this? What David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he said to them, The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. At first glance, many assume that Jesus here justifies David's actions in order to justify his own and that of his disciples. Therefore, these say, it is not lawful to set aside God's law, God's instructions, to meet our human needs. Well, that just cannot be, because Jesus clearly says in this passage that what David did was not lawful. David also lied in this case in saying he was on a commission commanded by Saul. Such a position that would say that it is not sinful to set aside God's instructions would make man the Lord of the Sabbath with authority to change God's law based on his own subjective sense of need. Others say this was an allowable exception. Again, remember, Jesus said what David did was not lawful. So what is the answer? What is Jesus doing and saying in this passage of Scripture? It seems that Jesus is here answering them ad hominem. He's making an argument to the man. The Pharisees had not condemned David when he did something clearly not lawful on a Sabbath day but they condemned Jesus' disciples for doing something in itself was within the law on a Sabbath. What they were doing was not unlawful. How inconsistent and hypocritical was that of those Pharisees? 
Jesus did not address whether David did right or wrong in this passage. He did not either condemn or exonerate David's conduct with the priests. Remember, he did not address David's lies on this occasion either. He is simply showing how the Jews gave the revered king, David, a pass, but condemned Jesus' own disciples. Jesus went on to say, The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is asserting the divine authority of the Son of Man. His rulership extends beyond the Jewish interpretations of the law, and it extends beyond their faulty applications of the law. Mark adds, in referring to this same event, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for Sabbaths. The Son of Man has insight and authority to interpret the intent of the law. And so the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Matthew adds that the Son of Man is greater than Jewish rituals. For example, he could declare sinless priests who both worked on the Sabbath, they did the duties of priests on that day, perhaps above all other days, and they violated cleanliness laws in offering the sacrifices. They were sinless in working on the Sabbath. The Son of Man came to show the intent of the law and then to fulfill the law. Well, let's go back to our text now for a moment. In Luke 6, at verse 6, it happened on another Sabbath also that he entered the synagogue and taught And a man was there whose right hand was withered. So the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. This is another Sabbath. It may be taken out of chronological order in the text of Luke to add to the statements that Jesus had already made that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. The scribes, of course, and the Pharisees wanted to entrap Jesus. They wanted to find some accusation against him. But he knew, verse 8, their thoughts. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy? And when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he did so and his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. The apocryphal book, Gospel According to the Hebrews, states that the man with the withered hand was a stonemason, that he was pleading with Jesus to heal him that he might not spend his life as a beggar. That's interesting to think about. Perhaps true, perhaps not. Matthew says Jesus asked which of them would have a sheep fall into a pit and would not lift it out on a Sabbath day. He then asked if man is not more valuable than 
than a sheep. Certainly he is. The scribes and Pharisees became angry, and they schemed what to do to Jesus. Well, those events happened on Sabbath days, and they are only precursors to challenges that the Jewish religious leaders made to Jesus throughout his ministry about his conduct on Sabbath days. In verse 12, we come to the choosing, the selection of Jesus' apostles. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray. And he continued all night in prayer to God. This is not the only time that Jesus continued all night in prayer to his Father. Verse 13 says, And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he named also apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother. James and John, they were brothers. Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. This word, Apostolus, or apostle, we call it in English, refers to one who is sent out on a mission as a representative of the sender. These apostoloi, the plural, were called to be his selected ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20 speaks of Christ's ambassadors. They would speak with authority from the king, who was Jesus. They would be his ambassadors to go into all the world. They were especially appointed to speak and act with authority, having been delegated to them, authority delegated to them, from the spiritual king who sent them into all the world to preach the gospel. This chart shows four times in the New Testament where the 12 apostles are listed. Of course, the last listing in the book of Acts occurs after Judas had betrayed the Lord and had given his life in suicide because of his guilt. There are things about this chart that are interesting to look at in the variations between some of the names that are given. And so I want to look with you at the other apostles that we have not talked about thus far. We have discussed Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and we have talked about Matthew from the previous chapter, chapter 5. I'd like to look at the other apostles with you. But first, let's note, we're not told why Jesus chose 12 rather than 7, for example, or 24 double that many, or a hundred, a rather large group of special disciples. Some have suggested it might be correlated to the twelve sons of Jacob and the twelve tribes of Israel, this fact that they were twelve. Others have said it might be that this number was manageable for teaching and travel, 
and that might be a fair assumption. And it might be that he would send some of them in pairs at times. And so 12 was a good number to distribute them to the work that he had for them to do. Well, at any rate, and there may be a combination of these thoughts in the selection. We're not really told why Jesus chose 12. Let's look at some of these other apostles. And the reason I'm doing this at this point is because these people would be very important to Jesus. Not much is said about some of these men in the New Testament but we can only imagine the importance of the work that they went out to do, each of them in taking the gospel to the whole world of that day. Philip is mentioned. Philip was from Bethsaida. You will remember Bethsaida was the little community to the east of Capernaum. He may have been known by these other apostles prior to becoming a disciple himself. His first significant act was to find Nathanael and bring him to Jesus. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 45. Jesus asked Philip in John chapter 6 where bread could be bought for the crowd before Jesus' great miracle of supplying food to the multitude. The Greeks came to Philip at the Passover with their request to see Jesus in John chapter 12. At the final Passover of Jesus, Philip showed confusion when Jesus said, If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. Well, it was Philip who replied, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient to us. Well, tradition says that Philip preached the gospel in Galatia, that's in Asia Minor, and Phrygia, provinces of Asia Minor. Polycrates of Ephesus says that Philip died at Hierapolis, by crucifixion. That's cited by Eusebius, the historian, in his Ecclesiastical History, Book 5. Bartholomew was also called Nathaniel. Bartholomew's name means son of Talmai or Ptolemy. Apparently, this is the Nathaniel whom Philip brought to Jesus. Bartholomew identifies his family. It allows for a more personal name. The name Bartholomew appears in the Synoptic Gospels, but not in the book of John, where the name Nathaniel is found. Nathaniel is not the name used in the Synoptic Gospels. It is Bartholomew. Further, Nathaniel was among other apostles after Jesus' resurrection, seen in the book of John. He is thought to have been of the tribe of Naphtali. Tradition says that he preached in Parthia. The tradition also says that he was flayed alive and then hanged on a cross. Still another says that he was martyred by drowning and that large portions of his flesh and bones washed ashore off Sicily at a later time. You can see how these traditions contradict one another so it is hard to put much stock in those 
traditions after the New Testament has been written. Thomas was another of the apostles. He is called Didymus. That word means twin. And he appears in John chapter 11 and John chapter 21. Details about his activities are mentioned only by John. When Jesus determined to go to Judea because Lazarus was ill, the others questioned his decision. This is in John chapter 11. Instead, Thomas said, Let us go also, that we may die with him. In chapter 14 of the book of John, Thomas says, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Thomas originally doubted Jesus' resurrection, but upon seeing the evidence, Thomas declared, My Lord and my God. Origen said that Thomas preached in Parthia and India. He may have died at Edessa in Upper Mesopotamia. James, the son of Alphaeus, is next. He is usually identified as the brother of Joseph and a son of the Mary who was among the women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him and who witnessed the crucifixion from afar. This Mary is also called a sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the wife of Clopas. It is doubtful, although not unthinkable, that James, this James, and Matthew were brothers, having the same father. Alphaeus was a rather common name. Their relationship is nowhere mentioned, however. They are not identified together, and their backgrounds seem to have been different. Early tradition suggests that James preached in Persia. Legends say that he was crucified, others that he was stoned by Jews in Jerusalem. We come to Simon, Simon called Zelotes. Jerome connected Simon with Cana, of Galilee. Out of that supposition came a legend that Simon was the bridegroom in the feast where Jesus turned water to wine. There is no real special evidence other than what Jerome says that that is the case. Among the zealots, he is called Zelotes, the zealot. Among the zealots, was a band of radical, violent fanatics known as the Sicarii, or assassins. A Sica was a small curved sword which could be easily concealed and quickly used even in the midst of a crowd where the perpetrator could easily and quickly escape before anyone knew what had happened. The original mission of the Sicarii was to assassinate Roman officials, but they later attacked Jews who disagreed with their philosophy or their methods. Their most extensive acts of violence and self-destruction occurred during the fall of Jerusalem, and the massacre at Masada. Simon is called a zealot. He is not called a member of the Sicarii. But the zealots were radical fanatics, we might call them politically, of that day. 
Jesus chose one of them to convert to his ways, follow his beatitudes, and other teachings of his Sermon on the Mount, and teach them to others. According to tradition, Simon did most of his preaching in Egypt and in northern Africa. A legend says that he and Jude were martyred together in Persia. Judas of James is next to last of these apostles chosen. He is also known by the surname Thaddeus and by the common name Lebius or Lebius in Matthew chapter 10 at verse 3. Because the literal translation of this text is Judas of James, some have questioned whether he was the brother of James or the son of James. Judas asked the Lord, How is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? In that verse of scripture, it is specifically affirmed that this Judas is not the Iscariot. Jesus responded, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. This is in John 14, verses 22 and 23. There is a legend that Judas went to Edessa in Upper Mesopotamia and spoke to its ruler about Jesus. Tradition says that he was slain with arrows at Mount Ararat. Well, the last of the apostles named is Judas Iscariot. And we know, of course, about Judas. He was the keeper of the purse, the treasurer, we might say, among Jesus' apostles. He was certainly the betrayer. And according to Acts chapter 1, he died by suicide. Well, we'll be seeing other things about the apostles as we go through our study. But as we said, some of these apostles are not otherwise named than in these lists of apostles that we have identified. Turn now to Luke chapter 6, verse 17. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. And they were healed, and the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. It is said here that they were all healed but they are not specified, that is, not specifically mentioned by their healings. The comments of Luke from here are focused on his teaching and on the things that he said to them. There was always an emphasis uh, in Jesus' life and actions on the spiritual, on the truth, rather than on the physical, the miracles that he did. We see here in this passage a contrast. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus was teaching and preaching in the synagogue at Nazareth, and his sermon was accompanied by his reading from a scroll of the book of Isaiah. These early 
teaching events had different venues, however. The Sermon on the Mount, this sermon on this level place, Luke will say, are contrasted to one another, very different in how Jesus would approach his teaching. Our passage says that Jesus came down to a level place. Remember in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we are on a mount, it is called. This is otherwise called a plain in level in uh, Luke chapter 6. These terms are compatible when you know the lay of the land there. They do not require that we consider this audience in Luke 6 different from the one who first heard the sermon recorded in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. This level place or plain could well have been on the side of the mount on which Jesus delivered the sermon in Matthew 5. It is not problematic, however, to see Matthew's account and Luke's account as two separate occasions where a very similar message was presented. We just don't know for certain in this case. Here is a picture of what is thought to have been the Mount of Beatitudes, north of Capernaum. You can see that we're not talking about a real high mountain that Jesus spoke from in the Sermon on the Mount. It is a rise, a hill, a mount, And it has a level place where the crowds could gather and multiply. We might want to compare for a moment Matthew and Luke on the record that they present on this sermon. Matthew's account is much longer, 109 verses as contrasted with Luke's summary of 29 verses. Matthew records eight or nine Beatitudes. Luke records only four. Luke records curses or woes attached to failure to understand and accept God's spiritual leadership. The woes or curses are not recorded by Matthew. Matthew was addressing a Jewish audience in writing the gospel according to Matthew. We have already seen that and are seeing further evidence of it. Luke addresses a Greek audience. Matthew referred to the law of Moses in his account of the sermon, while Luke does not speak directly concerning the law. The Greeks would have no benefit in what he would say about that. There are issues in Jesus' ability to teach the crowd. And what we find coming out of those issues is that Jesus was an absolute master teacher. There were things that Jesus had to overcome in teaching to these multitudes of people, hundreds, thousands of people. On one occasion, he fed 5,000 people 
most of his teaching was out in open air. It was along roadways, on hillsides, by the seashore, in the streets of the little villages and towns. His teaching had to be immediately arresting. He was not going to be in a pulpit or in a lecture hall or a schoolroom or a church building like we have today. Sometimes he was in the synagogues of the Jews and there would be some of that opportunity. But in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, or this Sermon on the Plain, or the level place it is called, his teaching had to be immediately arresting. In other words, it had to get the people's attention, keep it in such a way that they would remember what he said. His teaching had to also have a universal appeal. He was speaking to various ages and maturity. He was speaking to young and old. He was speaking to those who had much religious background and those who would have had nearly none. His teaching had to be intelligible at first hearing. It had to be such that the people would get it and that they would get it clearly the first time. And his teaching had to be memorable, permanently memorable. And so he used scripture reminding them of things they already knew from God's word. He taught them in parables. He taught them with hyperbole with imagery, with humor at times, with logic, with questions. He is just a master teacher using all the forms available to him to arrest the minds of the people and cause them to remember the things that he said. And when you read the Sermon on the Mount, surely you're impacted immediately by the power of the things that Jesus taught. How did Jesus see his mission, his teaching mission, in addition to his sacrificial mission? He regarded himself as bringing the message of God to the people, and certainly he did. He regarded himself as equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit. He regarded himself as the fulfillment of the prophets and their earlier messages to the people. And he regarded himself as the messenger of mercy. He came for the poor in spirit, the spiritually blind, the captives in sin, the needy, and he was providing their needs. There are three names or titles that were applied to Jesus by his disciples and others to identify him as a teacher. The first is this word didaskalos. It's just a teacher or a master, as we would think in old English terms, in the schoolroom. It was the common word for teacher. Then there is the word epistetes, a headmaster, a teacher at the head of the situation. And then third, there was the rabbi, the word rabbi, distinguished and acknowledged teacher, sometimes thought of as the great one, was a rabbi or a rabbi, they might have called him. Well, in spite of these dignified terms, there were those 
who refuse to accept Jesus. There were all kinds of reactions to Jesus' teaching. They wondered at what he had to say. They were angry at times, full of wrath. They were astonished, the text says, all of those terms in Luke 4. In Luke 5, they were penitent. They blasphemed, some of them did. They were afraid at the things that he taught. Those terms in Luke chapter 5. And here in our text, in Luke chapter 6, they watched him. Particularly his opponents watched him. And in verse 11, they were filled with madness and wanted to kill him. Of course, all those terms are very carefully interspersed throughout the narrative. And perhaps they're intended to ask us to think about how others reacted to Jesus' teaching and then especially what is our reaction to Jesus' teaching. Well, as we move on, we look at Luke's record of this sermon on this level place. And he, as did Matthew, begins with the Beatitudes, this blessedness that comes through having the right spirit. His list of Beatitudes will be shorter than that of Matthew. Matthew has eight or nine, depending on how they are counted. Luke has just four. The text says he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast out your name as evil, for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. This word, blessed, or sometimes pronounced just blessed, comes from the Greek word makarios. It's a state of contentment due to well-being. Those who are truly blessed are free from spiritual care from guilt, from fear, from dread, from intense concern. They're spiritually joyful and inwardly content, even though they may be persecuted. They rejoice in the fact that they are right with God and righteous enough for the persecutors to want to persecute them. This state of mind and spirit is the result of faith that we are accepted with God and we are his children. What did he mean by these beatitudes, these hyperboles that he uses? Blessed are you poor. Well, I think he was referring to those who are poor in spirit. That's the way Matthew records it. In Matthew 5 at verse 3, those who are humble, humble in spirit. And he says, blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Certainly he is primarily talking about those who are searching for righteousness. Matthew says that they're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Righteousness. 
And then he said, blessed are you who weep, primarily those who mourn in guilt, but comforted in all sorrow because of the blessings brought to man by Jesus Christ. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, when they revile you, when they cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Those are the blessed things that Jesus is talking about. But then notice in verse 24, he says, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Now these woes are not recorded by Matthew. Some see this as evidence of a second or a different sermon. It could be that Matthew didn't record these and Luke does from the same sermon. But notice how these four woes correspond to, but are in contrast to, the four Beatitudes. They contrast or they compare to the four blessings. Well, moving on quickly. In Luke chapter 6 at verse 27, Jesus says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. The gospel is based on love, God's love for mankind, even when man was a sinner. So God wants us to love even our enemies. The rest of the sermon seems to fall into line with that thought as we read it carefully. We'll just read the text as we go now with very little comment to the end of this chapter, a few verses. He says, To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Do you see how that do you see how that is in keeping with loving your enemies? He says, and just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. We call that the golden rule. Do unto those as you would have them do unto you. But if you love those who love you, what credit is it that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies. Here we are again. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. I think he is saying judge not with harsh judgment so that you won't be judged. 
with harsh judgment. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. In verse 39, Jesus spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Jesus is calling on his disciples to remove self-righteous hypocrisy from themselves. The blind leaders of the blind were those who had specks, planks, even in their own eyes. In Luke 6, verse 43, beginning, he says, A good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Goodness comes from the heart, and we must guard our hearts always to serve the Lord. And then he says to all, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you to whom he is like, He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Well, that brings us to the end of chapter 6. You have heard many sermons based upon Jesus' sermon, and we have moved quickly over that today. But we will come back to almost all of those principles as we look through the book of Luke and study it carefully to find God's will. I hope this study is valuable to you, and I hope that today's study has been meaningful to you. Have a good day.